so a very good evening a very good afternoon everyone and at the outset i must thank uh, dr bansi sabu sir and team dacon for giving this opportunity and uh, uh, sandeep rai sir and brish sir for chairing the session so i'll be discussing a very important topic which uh, dr sandeep rai sir told is initiating insulin in patients with type 2 diabetes in tune with indian reality a case based approach Both my slides are visible, and uh, the disclosure is it's a Nova sponsored talk, and uh, I'll be discussing on how to initiate insulin. So uh, let me first uh, start with the burden of uncontrolled uh, diabetes in India, and if we see the various data starting from 2014 by uh, Dr. Mohan et al. that uh, only 19.7 percent of people with type 2 diabetes had A1C of less than 7 percent. That means only 19 percent had good glycemic control. Uh, if we go to the type study in 2019 then uh, again the a1c level less than 7 is there in 23.4% of patients 2020 the car study has shown only 16.3% could achieve the glycemic target and the recent 2020 idci uh, trial has uh, clearly mentioned that only 22% of people have a1c less than 7% and this is the dismal figure uh, from india showing that uh, Uh, even with all the drugs from 2014 to 2020, and with the advancement of diabetes and the science, still only uh, 18 to 22 percent of patients could achieve a good glycemic control. Now, uh, one of the major mechanism. I am not telling this is the only mechanism, but one of the major mechanism is uh, delay in the insulin initiation. If we see this. Uh, Uh, data, a very nice data by Nair et al. Uh, depicting the prescription pattern of anti-hyperglycemic agents uh, in diabetes, depending on the duration of diabetes, and you can see that uh, a good part. I should say that uh, the metformin has been very nicely used uh, up to 80 to 90 percent of patients. But uh, the bad factor is about the insulin. You can see the. blue line over there and uh, these are the x axis showing the duration of the diabetes from 5 years to 10 years to 15 years to 20 years and you can see that the early part of diabetes there is absolutely very less number of patients who are put to insulin and the insulin starts always after 10 years uh, this is our own figures and uh, even if it starts at 10 to 15 years or even at 15 to 20 years the initiation is quite uh, low because only 25 or 26% of patients have been started on insulin whereas the other drugs like sulfonylurea uh, pioglitazone have been quite rampantly used and they are actually increased in due course of time but uh, which should not be actually uh, regarding the sulfonylurea now uh, the typical therapeutic progression of type 2 diabetes we know that uh, at the onset of diabetes almost 50% of beta cell is gone and there is a progressive decline in the beta cell so at some point of time we have to start insulin and that has to start early on and more aggressive and we must control the blood glucose quite aggressively from the very beginning itself uh, so uh, we start with lifestyle and oid but when we start with insulin it has to pass through three phases and they are uh important steps like we initiate the insulin we optimize the insulin and then we intensify the insulin therapy initiation of insulin therapy many uh, western guidelines recommend the basal insulin even our rssda also recommends basal or premix insulin therapy optimization of the insulin is that we titrate the dose uh, of the initiated insulin to reach or maintain a glycemic target now uh, intensification is when we have given in uh, the regimen but it is not covering the post meal uh, glucose surges and then we intensify with either a basal plus like basal plus 1 2 3 or 4 bolus doses or the premix insulin therapy so that's how the initiation optimization and intensification should start i'll be dealing with initiation i think uh, dr mithun and my uh, friend dr sujay will be discussing on optimizing and intensifying the insulin therapy so unlike insulin addition of subsequent oids doesn't benefit uh, and uh, and uh, we use multiple oids and in fact we use in our clinical practice we use 2 3 4 oids uh, in a, in a given patient and we use that only for convenience acceptance by patients many a times patient tell we are not going to start insulin and limited consultation time in a in a very busy opd you don't have time maybe to explain about the 
insulin injection. So uh, there, there lies the convenience of giving an OED. But that's not correct, actually. If you see the left side of the uh, diagram, it shows that how with escalation of OEDs or different OEDs, the HB1C actually doesn't uh, benefit. If you see the, if you are starting with two OEDs, then the A1C reduction is significant by 1% before and after treatment. With three OEDs, it is 0.5%. Up to three OEDs is fine, but once we start after three OEDs, another OED or four OEDs or five OEDs, it doesn't have any effect on the A1C level. And especially in this study, uh, they have not shown any benefit uh, of increasing the number of OEDs. But if you start in insulin therapy after maybe two OEDs or three OEDs, the reduction of the HB1C is quite significant. You can see almost 1.3% reduction in the pre-treatment versus post-treatment uh, initiation of insulin. So successive OEDs provide uh, lessening effect and there is a substantial benefit from initiating insulin. So we should not be shy away from sighing away from starting an insulin and we must start it uh, early on and aggressively and control the blood glucose in a nice manner. So what do the recommendations tell? So recommendation from global and the Indian guidelines, if we see the ADA 2020 and to that extent 2021 also, HbA1c above the target despite dual or triple therapy, we must start with an injectable preparation. And ADA tells that uh, we can consider a GLP-1 receptor agonist as the first injectable prior to insulin. But uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist has got its own limitation and sometimes it may not be that effective in that condition if the A1C is very high. If the A1C is more than 10%, symptoms or evidence of catabolism exist like weight loss, polyuria or polydipsia, we must start with an insulin therapy. So RSSDI ESI 2020 guidelines uh, tells that insulin therapy should be considered in all patients failing to achieve glycemic targets on three oral agents. Consider initiating insulin in type 2 diabetic patients with symptomatic severe hyperglycemia or unstable state. So that's the RSSDI ESI guideline. We, we can initiate with a long-acting insulin therapy with metformin and other anti-diabetic therapy. If the A1C is less than 0.8, we may start with 10 units or 0.1 to 0.2 units per kg body weight, preferably at bedtime, the basal insulin. Or if the A1C is more than 8%, we can start with a higher dose, uh, maybe at 0.2 to 0.3 units per kg per day, preferably at the bedtime. And this is exactly the statement from RSSDA ESI consensus. It tells that uh, the providers should avoid using insulin as a threat or describing it as a sign of personal failure or punishment. So we should not be using insulin as a sign of threat or describing it as a sign of personal failure or punishment. As newer and effective OEDs have been made available, it is recommended to consider insulin in cases where patients fail to achieve or maintain A1C level after administration of three OEDs, out of which one should be newer agent or if patient is intolerant to any individual agent or combination of the agent. So uh, after three OEDs, the RSSDA or the Indian guidelines recommends that we must start insulin. And one of these OED should be a newer OED or the, uh, we know what are the newer OEDs, maybe an SGLT2 or DP4 inhibitor. But though there are several newer oral agents available, their glucose lowering potential is actually relatively less or maybe uh, um, uh, or maybe uh, less potential and so uh, compared with the insulin and insulin should never be delayed if A1C remains high after three OEDs. So that was one group of patient where insulin has to be started after the OED failure. Now there are another subset of patients where we must start insulin from the very diagnosis itself. So what are those conditions? ADA 2020 tells if there is an ongoing catabolism like weight loss, if symptoms of hyperglycemia are present, that is A1C is more than 10% or blood glucose level is more than 300 milligram are very high. RSSDA ESI tells that individuals with symptomatic hyperglycemia and metabolic decompensation should receive an initial anti-hyperglycemic regimen containing insulin with or without metformin. So that's about the RSSDA ESI 2020 recommendation. Now, uh, uh, once we intend to start insulin, we must convince the patient that the insulin is required. And so there is a acute or urgent need for an insulin conversation. So insulin conversation is very important. And a conversation about insulin initiation should be started shortly after diagnosis. Even after diagnosis, we can start uh, telling the patient about the benefits of insulin. 
Timely conversation provides an opportunity to set a positive context for insulin therapy. So once the patient is primed beforehand, so once we tell at the time of need, they may accept it more uh, uh, more logically. So this helps prevent a sense of guilt of personal failure regarding insulin initiation among patients with type 2 diabetes. So we should not be telling that insulin is initiated because you have failed. In fact, it is uh, the patient who has not failed is bitter cell has failed. And we should not be telling the person's failure to that. Healthcare providers should focus on open-ended questions to identify the needs of patients and address any concerns regarding insulin therapy. It has to be absolutely individualized. There are sample conversations. Uh, one of the sample conversation is that the doctor telling diabetes is a progressive disorder and insulin is the option that we may have to consider in future from the very beginning. When the body reaches an insulin deficient state, insulin has to be supplemented to ensure good long-term glycemic control and also prevent complication. Starting on insulin doesn't mean that you have not managed your sugar well. It is just the natural course of the disease. So these are some of the sample open-ended uh, uh, questionnaire or conversations. So one should adapt to that. So coming to the important uh, section, that is what are the factions that determine which uh, insulin to be used, whether it's a basal-based or a premix insulin therapy, we need to see three factors. One is glycemic parameters. What are the phases of life the patient is going? Indian realities of diabetes care. Glycemic parameters at insulin initiation, I think we have, uh, we have to see the fasting plasma glucose. We need to see the postprandial blood glucose and its increment from the fasting plasma glucose. There is another terminology like, like BEAM, that is the bedtime uh, blood glucose and the next day morning blood glucose level. And they also influence which type of insulin we should be using at, at what time we should be using. PPG increment, is, this slide is very important for, uh, for, for, uh, for any physician who, is, who intend to start an insulin. So we need to see uh, what is the postprandial increment from fasting to PP, how much is the increment. If it is more than 54 milligram per deciliter, we must consider for giving premix insulin therapy. Is the patient likely to manage basal-based therapy with intensification is needed? So I think we must ask if we are starting with a basal insulin, whether we can uh, manage later on with a basal plus or basal bolus. If the patient uh, uh, is conducive to start uh, this regimen, we can start with a basal therapy. Is there a large carbohydrate intake of one to two preferred meals or one to two major meals contain the highest carbohydrate? The answer should be towards premix insulin. And is the patient's lifestyle is predictable? Like the patient takes two meals in a day, it's almost a predictable pattern. Then I think a premix insulin is also more favorable. But if the lifestyle is very erratic, if the carbohydrate intake is less than multiple feedings, probably basal insulin is preferable. So premix insulin is preferred when there is a uh, fasting and pre postprandial difference more than 54 milligram per deciliter. Now coming to phases of life, uh, the Children, the basal bolus insulin is the recommendation and uh, what uh, my previous speaker, Madam, has told that uh, for children, the recommendation is NPH, Detemer, Degludec and Glargin and they, uh, up to one year, all this can be given. But for Glargin, the recommendation is after two years or the approval is after two years. Then for short acting or the bolus, we have the regular insulin, Aspart, Fias, more than one year of age, Lispro, we can give after two years of age and Glulysin after six years of age. For adults and elderly, we can use a co-formulation or premix, which is easy and compliant, or we can go for a basal-based therapy, basal plus or basal bolus. For pregnancy, it is uh, mostly the bolus therapy or the basal bolus therapy. And for basal therapy, we need to see give NPH detimer or glargin recently approved, or we can use human insulin or insulin lispro insulin, aspart, fast-acting insulin, aspart. Now, the third point is about the Indian reality. We live in India when we have our own challenges, like we take high carb diet, high PPG contribution to the HB1C, uncontrolled on multiple OIDs, patient come with four or five OIDs and still uncontrolled, poor adherence to lifestyle is very uh, common factor in our setup and limited consultation time. We see um, uh, 40 to 50 patients uh, in a busy OPD and we have limited consultation time. So clinical case, uh, um, uh, coming to a case scenario, which I'll be uh, discussing is a 42 year old female. The occupation is a school teacher, not from an affluent community of a 
average socioeconomic status. The duration of diabetes is seven years. She is sedentary. She is a teacher. Weight is seventy kg. BMI is twenty six. HB one C has come as nine point eight, and her fasting is one seventy. Whereas BP is around two eighty. Post breakfast and post dinner, it has been two sixty four. Uh, the rest of the parameters are uh, normal, and uh, there are dyslipidemia. But presenting complaint is that she has mood swings, uh, tiredness, insomnia, and palatal numbness of lower extremities, suggestive of burning pain, suggestive of neuropathy. She has also lost weight up to three kgs in the last three months, and she tells that she is taking her food properly but losing weight. That shows some of the osmotic features or the catabolic state. Now, drug history patient is on dimipride, metformin, two milligram, one thousand milligram twice a day, and pioglitazon, fifteen milligram once a day. Family history is to have diabetes in both the father and mother. Father died at age of fifty-five years because of premature CAD. Mother had diabetic kidney disease. Personal history: she takes uh, two meals, larger meals, before going to school once and at dinner, and it's a carbohydrate-rich meals. She has got a busy lifestyle. Erratic eating patterns is also there. So patient uncontrolled on multiple OIDs, uncontrolled diabetes of longer duration. She has got diabetic neuropathy, and there is a catabolic stage in terms of weight loss, and there is an urgent need for insulin therapy. Now, which insulin to prescribe? And uh, uh, this is a case scenario, and the patient has been started on biphasic insulin, uh, human insulin, twice a day, and uh, the, it's uh, it has been started and biphasic human insulin is time tested and there is a market over the last three years it has been three decades it has been available for the last thirty years it is well tolerated safety profile is well proven highly effective in reducing both the fasting PP and A1C with unlimited potential low cost and hence affordable and average patients and affordability is very important for this patient because. From the very beginning, it was mentioned that she she cannot afford any expensive medication. Absolutely pain free experience with no pain or no fine needle. Now, uh, uh, a major meal chosen and how patient was started on injection mixed at ten units twice a day, one before the she takes the brunch with the breakfast and lunch at ten a.m. and goes to the school, so one at that time and the other at the dinner time, thirty minutes before breakfast and thirty minutes before dinner. Device chosen is a flex pen, disposable pen with two simple steps: dial and inject. Can help insulin initiation initiation with OD failure because once the patient sees the pain and if you give one unit at your chamber, the patient is quite convinced. And then you can switch over to a durable uh, pen like a permanent pen like No Pen Four for this patient. Reasons for choosing a biphasic human insulin thirty in this patient: uh, sees insulin naive. With inadequate response to triple oral therapy, uh, high carb content, high PPG content, and has complication like uh, high A1C and neuropathy also. Key clinical considerations: start uh, BHI 30. What should be the starting dose? At what time of the day should uh, this insulin be administered? Which device to choose? How to inject this insulin? How to adjust the dose of BHI 30? Now the administer uh, alone or in combination of OIDs or bolus insulin recommended daily starting dose is ten units or zero point three units per kg body weight administered once a day or twice a day with the main meals usually requires subsequent individual dose adjustments later on and these are the two pens which are currently available one is the flex pen and one is the permanent pen the flex pen initially it would be easier because the patient can. easy to read and dose the scale accurate and consistent dosing whereas the no pen 4 is accurate dosing delivery for more than 5 years and it is a permanent pen so one is using uh, flex pen and probably will require long term insulin therapy we can convert to a permanent pen later on the recommendation by dr covil et al in which was published in japi is that it is recommended to start premix insulin Uh, um, the biphasic human insulin as 10 units once daily at pre breakfast and pre dinner the recommended target for titration is pre meal value of around 80 to 130 mg pre breakfast dose to be modified if titrated based on pre dinner values and vice versa so if the fasting is high we need to start the evening dose and if the uh, pre dinner is high we can increase the morning dose it is recommended to titrate the dose once in a week based on the pre dinner or pre breakfast values It is recommended to modify the dose based on the lowest or mean value of the three most recent pre-breakfast or pre-dinner values. BHI needs to be given 30 minutes before a meal. It is recommended to reduce the dose by 10 to 20 percent for patients reporting hypoglycemia. 
patients uncontrolled on multiple oids uh, if you see the zero weeks four weeks and 12 weeks uh, the patient was started on 10 10 units uh, later on increased to 12 and 10 units because there was a little bit higher postprandial uh, finding of 180 at 12 weeks the patient was stabilized at 14 and 10 uh, insulin the hb1c has also significantly reduced Coming to oral uh, medication, I think there would be controversy and I know there would be questions for that. How do, the dose has been halved once we started on insulin and uh, we can continue with a lesser dose of glimepiride and metformin. Metformin, obviously, we have to continue. For sulfonylurea initiation, we may reduce it to half and later on we can stop it. Pioglutazone was stopped. Initiation was uh, 10, 10 units, but after that, it was titrated to 12 and 14 units. The result end of the 12 weeks, fasting was 116, PP was 140, post dinner was 130, and HB1C decreased significantly. So I think that was the um, case scenario. And uh, with that, I learned. Thank you for the patient hearing.